The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Maury Markwitz, and I'm president of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the virtual launch for the Northeast region of the Roadmap to the U.S. Hydrogen Economy and introduce to you our Masters of Ceremonies for this event, Kimberly Henderson, partner at McKinsey & Company. Kimberly? Thank you, Maury. And before we begin, I'll quickly lay out our order of events for this session. So I'll begin the event with a review of the major findings of the Roadmap to a U.S. Hydrogen Economy Report. We'll then host a short Q&A session with myself and with our industry panel of speakers. Following the Q&A, we will have a series of industry presentations expanding on the role of the private sector in achieving the goals of the roadmap. We will then conclude with another Q&A with all of the panelists again this time. Should you have questions throughout this event, please submit them through the questions box in GoToWebinar. And with that, it is my pleasure to begin. The development of the U.S. Roadmap to a Hydrogen Economy was a collaborative effort by about 20 companies over the better part of a year. And as you can see here, this is a very diverse group. It includes major power and gas utilities, major oil and gas players, automotive, um, hydrogen and fuel cell industry leaders, um, and we've got Microsoft representing the, the tech sector. Um, this was all pulled together and coordinated by the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. Um, it also had the support of EPRI in the National Labs and REL in Argonne. So while I have the great pleasure of presenting the findings for you today, I want to be clear this was a collaborative effort of all of these organizations here. Now they decided to come together because now is really a turning point in hydrogen. Um, and that's a turning point for a number of reasons. Um, there's global action to limit carbon dioxide emissions, there's falling costs of renewables, and we're seeing industry alliances forming around the world that are making a big difference in terms of getting hydrogen onto the agenda um, in, in markets you know, well beyond the US. And so why hydrogen? So what are the benefits? Why do people care about it? Um, we've articulated four in the roadmap. Um, one is for future economic growth and employment. Um, this can be a core part of the future economy of the US. A second rationale is resiliency and reliability. Um, particularly as we decarbonize the power grid, for instance, hydrogen can play a meaningful role in making our energy system more resilient. Um, third, it's, it's a clean energy source that reduces pollution. The so local air pollutants um, can be reduced through use of hydrogen. And then last, but certainly not least, um, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So hydrogen is fundamental for meeting climate commitments that have been made across businesses, across sectors, and across geographies. Um, you simply cannot get um, the decarbonization that, that many are targeting without at scale hydrogen. So with those benefits in mind, the participating companies developed this roadmap, which is a 10 year plan to develop this industry in the US at speed and at scale. And it covers where the hydrogen market is today. So what's our starting point? Where it could go? What's the vision for the future demand of hydrogen? Um, how would we supply it? You know, what are the ways of getting low carbon hydrogen? And then what needs to happen? Um, how do we actually catalyze this, this new industry um, over four time horizons, which you see at the bottom of the page here? Um, so it lays out a high level roadmap for the next 10 years. So I'll give you a preview of all of that here, starting with demand and, and what you actually do with hydrogen. So there are um, five uses of hydrogen and we'll show them here one by one on this page. So the first is power generation and grid balancing for our power system. So at the, the grid level for centralized power, hydrogen can play a critical role in providing storage, long duration storage, which enables renewables at scale. Um, it also can help support distributed power, so off-grid power or backup power. Um, hydrogen can be used on site for those purposes and proven resiliency. Um, let's go to the next one, transportation. So this is a key use of hydrogen um, and it, it applies across transportation modes. So everything from material, materials handling, so think forklifts, um, light and heavy duty vehicles, captive fleets, rail, 
um, hydrogen can be used in pretty much any form of transport. Um, third, uh, fuel for residential and commercial buildings. So if you think right now we've got a, a gas grid, hydrogen can actually be injected into the gas grid um, and potentially convert the entire gas grid to hydrogen at some point in certain places, can be used for combined heat and power. Um, feedstock for industry. So this is a primary use of, of hydrogen today in certain industries, ammonia, methanol, refineries. Um, there are further industries that can use hydrogen to decarbonize, steel, aviation, marine. And then lastly, fuel for industry. Um, so any industry that needs, for instance, high temperature heat has hydrogen as an option um, to decarbonize. So, so what's our starting point? Um, I mentioned that this is used as a feedstock for industry. Um, this is how it's used in the US today. So you see in the, the little pie chart, the uses of hydrogen, ammonia and methanol refining some metals. Um, and we already have a market of 11.4 million metric tons of hydrogen. Um, worth about $18 billion. Um, this hydrogen is uh, created through a process called steam methane reforming, um, using methane and converting it to hydrogen. This process um, emits CO2. So this is, um, this is actually a CO2 source today. Um, there are new technologies and new ways of producing hydrogen that would be low carbon or zero carbon. And the, the roadmap articulates those. Go to the next page. So this has a, the, a list of options for producing low carbon electricity, low carbon hydrogen. Um, so the first is what's called water electrolysis um, using low carbon electricity. So using renewables and water to then create, um, um, create hydrogen. Uh, steam methane reforming with carbon capture. So if we capture the carbon, then obviously that, that would stop that from being a CO2 emitter um, or using renewable natural gas as a feedstock. Direct gasification of waste is another option. Um, and then lastly, capturing obviously any byproduct hydrogen that we can recover from other industrial processes. The pathway described in the report is agnostic of the source. Um, it articulates that the hydrogen would need to be low carbon um, to be scaled at this level. Um, you would need to, to assume it's low carbon to have that benefit, which means also converting our existing hydrogen to be low carbon. Um, but it could be through any of these pathways. So the report has some deep dives behind this. Um, so for instance, here's one on carbon capture, where you can see the carbon capture, um, the carbon storage capacity in the US. So in the, the colored parts of the map, there's saline formations, unminable coal areas. And this actually maps pretty nicely to some of the existing hydrogen plants, which are the, the triangles on the chart, and the existing ammonia plants, which also use hydrogen. Um, and so actually there's a, you know, a nice kind of geographic alignment uh, for carbon capture and hydrogen production today. Um, there are also maps that we've done on, on renewable supply and how that can be used to, across the country to develop hydrogen. But the US has an abundance of domestic resources to produce hydrogen at scale. So what's the vision? Where does this roadmap lead us to? Uh, so the, the, this is the vision of the scale up of the volume of hydrogen that could be used in, in the US. So today I mentioned about 11 million metric tons. In 2030, um, in our ambitious scenario, which is uh, the real kind of at scale vision, we could see that going to 17. Um, and then by 2050, around 60, give or take a million metric tons per year. Now the participating organizations built a trajectory for each application. Um, which I'll go into in more detail in a minute. I'm drawing on the expertise of all of the participating companies to come up with a vision of for every use of hydrogen, what could we imagine the scale up could be over time um, um, as we you know, seek to, to get these benefits for the US economy. And when we bring this all together, it actually would account for a big part of the US energy system. So this would be on the order of 14% of the US energy system, potentially more. Uh, which is in line with what we see in other scenarios done in other countries and globally for the role of hydrogen in a low carbon economy. Um, to give a sense of order of magnitude, I mean, power is about 20% of the energy system. So 15% is really quite sizable. So uh, many applications are already emerging and new ones would need to grow as the economy decarbonizes. So the roadmap articulates each of these applications. 
um, from the established and emerging ones today, which include things like distributed power, um, which we see hydrogen fuel cells already replacing diesel generators um, in cases. Forklifts, which there are already about 40,000 forklifts in operation in the US today. Um, transport, um, so again, fuel cell electric vehicles, which would coexist with battery electric vehicles. Um, those both have a role to play in a decarbonized economy due to different characteristics. And the existing feedstocks, uh, which would grow a little bit. Um, and then we've got a set of things that are what we call decarbonization, short-term and long-term moves. And this is um, the use of hydrogen in industries that are otherwise hard to decarbonize. Steel, aviation, high-grade industrial heat, um, residential and commercial buildings. You'll see one of the long-term moves on here is using hydrogen and centralized power um, to get to a zero carbon power system. I think with the, with the current administration, the target for that is maybe moving, moving forward and we might see that by 2035. So what's the path forward across these applications? Um, if you go to the next page, Connor. Thank you. So the, the, what the roadmap shows is how we move more of these applications to maturity over time. And so again, some of these are already at scale. We've got a lot of forklifts in the US, distributed power is growing, um, but some are under development. Um, we, we have some uh, vehicles on the road in the US today, but it's still early stage. Um, and so this shows how we would move through from what we call the immediate next steps phase to early scale up diversification and finally broad rollout at which point these applications would be mature and commercialized in about a decade from now across across pretty much all of them. If you go to the next page. So the participating company is aligned on a set of ambitious roadmap milestones so we can see whether we're tracking towards that vision or not. And um, we'll show a couple of them here um, just as examples. The one is the vehicle sales, so fuel cell electric vehicle sales, which again, you know, at the time the roadmap was written, it was pretty small scale, you know, in the low thousands. Um, but envisioning that would need to go to the, you know, seven figures over a million in the next decade, um, and we can track the progress towards that. Um, to support those vehicles, obviously, we need to build out the fueling stations as well. And so the roadmap shows the, you know, the amount of fueling stations today, which again, there are some, but not nearly enough and then the amount we would need to support this vehicle fleet in the future. So we can see if we're on track on both of those metrics in parallel. So if we step back and look at what does this mean for the economy, um, it, it, it in many ways would be a boon for the economy. So in the next 10 years, this could create significant investment and in jobs. Um, the roadmap quantified how much private sector investment could be catalyzed with public support. And um, that investment is in everything from the hydrogen production capacity, the refueling stations, uh, the fuel cell vehicles, and power plants um, to support you know, hydrogen-based generation. And we see that by 2030, you could be talking about $8 billion in annual investment going into this market. Um, that would, of course, create jobs that come with it um, on order of over half a million jobs by 2030 in this, in this ambitious scenario. Now, if we look at the broader benefits, um, this would strengthen the U.S. economy, um, creating an estimated $750 billion in revenue um, for companies and over 3 million jobs. Um, this would notably maintain, help maintain competitiveness of the U.S. domestically and internationally um, in the energy system. Uh, the U.S. is a global leader in these industries today. Um, hydrogen is, is an energy industry of the future, and this is a chance for the U.S. to maintain its energy industry leadership. Um, this would create a highly competitive source of domestically produced low emissions energy. This could be 100% domestically produced. We don't need to import. Um, it provides significant environmental benefits. So I mentioned the carbon emissions reduction. You, you need the hydrogen to get to deep, deep um, carbon emissions reductions in many industries. And also nitrous oxide. So air pollution um, could be improved materially. So these are the benefits we could imagine by 2050. But this is not on autopilot. This is not the base case uh, based on our current trajectory. This is an ambitious vision that we would need to see some changes to bring about. And there's three categories of action here, which I'll go through one by one. 
So they're setting the North Star, um, kickstarting markets, and then making systematic changes. So if we talk, start with setting the North Star, the key action here is to set dependable technology neutral decarbonization goals. So that's that's needed to be able to catalyze the foundations of hydrogen and, and spark the right investments. Um, so that dependability of future goals and future targets is, is important for industry. The second area was kickstarting markets. And there's four activities that the participating companies identified within this that, that are needed. The so one is creating public incentives to bridge barriers to initial market launch. A second is supporting infrastructure development. There was a lot of supporting infrastructure needed um, to enable this roadmap. Third is expanding the use of hydrogen across sectors to achieve economies of scale. And fourth is including hydrogen-based options in government procurement, um, which clearly government plays a key role in procuring in many of these industries. And so if we go to the third, making systematic changes to pave the way for a hydrogen economy, um, the key actions here are supporting research, development, demonstration, and deployment. And so to be clear, it's not just R&D, it's the full R, D, D, and D, so all of it. Um, harmonizing technical codes and safety standards, supporting outreach and workforce development. Um, so we have a workforce that knows how to use hydrogen, knows how to handle hydrogen, and reviewing energy sector regulations to ensure they account for hydrogen. The energy sector is a highly regulated sector today. Those regulations were all built around the energy system of the past. Um, they would need to be revisited um, to enable hydrogen at scale. And so for those who have not seen it yet, the full roadmap is available online. And so here's the, the website, www.ushydrogenstudy.org. Um, we would like to open things up now and begin taking questions on the roadmap and on the role of hydrogen in the US. If you have any questions, please submit them through the questions box provided. And I'll also ask my fellow panelists um, to join me here and turn on their cameras now. Um, to help answer any questions that may be appropriate. Um, they are living and breathing this industry every day, so we want to benefit from their expertise. And we have Connor Dolan from the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association, who will be facilitating the Q&A and will be sharing questions from the participants. So Connor, um, do we have any questions to kick us off? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, our first question is for you, Kimberly. Uh, McKinsey has global uh, has a global vantage point uh, working with companies around the world. How do you see momentum in the United States on hydrogen versus other countries around the world? Great. So I think the U.S. is at a turning point um, on hydrogen. Um, it is coming a little slower than what we've seen in other markets. And so I do think that um, the U.S. is uh, able to catch up, but it is it is playing catch up a little bit. Um, so we've seen Europe pushing really hard on hydrogen. I'll give you a few examples in a minute. And then also Asian countries have pursued hydrogen as part of their industrial strategy. So countries like Japan and South Korea, um, Australia is planning to build very large scale hydrogen facilities um, to export to some of these markets. Um, if we look at, if we compare the US to Europe, um, so we see in, uh, around the world, there are on the order of 230 large projects in the pipeline. Um, more than half of them are in Europe and less than 10% are in the US. So to give you a sense of order of magnitude, more of the activity is there. Um, Europe has set very clear targets. Um, so they're talking tens of gigawatts, 80 gigawatt target um, with regulatory support behind that. And you know the US has a roadmap. So we start this, these companies have started to build a vision, but we don't have a, a formal Kind of set of targets behind that you know sponsored by the government in the same way and europe has announced a whole lot of funding um so about 40 billion dollars of funding for hydrogen whereas i believe in north america there's maybe about one billion dollars earmarked um, for hydrogen um so again you just much larger quantities um, mobilizing in europe today um so again well we're, we're things are changing very fast in the us and i know that our panelists will speak to how quickly things are moving so we'll see how things evolve, but we're starting probably from a few steps behind versus other markets. Thanks, Kimberly. Would anyone else on the panel like to uh, answer that question?
Connor. This is Bob Wimmer from Toyota. Um, I'll just add that from the standpoint of vehicle sales, um, the U.S. is is well ahead of the rest of the world. Um, for the case of the Mirai, we've we've sold more Mirai in the U.S. than we have the rest of the the world combined. Um, I think that the the approach in in California particularly has has led to um, wide deployment of vehicles. The infrastructure has grown. I think it's it shows that. You know, even with without centralized, uh, strong centralized support, we we have gotten a foothold. We've got a long ways to go, of course, but um, I, I think we we have uh, gotten a, quite a good start in in the U.S. It's a good ad, Bob. Great, and uh, building on that, we have a couple questions that are on a similar track. Uh, what are some actions state governments can take to encourage the adoption of fuel cell vehicles? And what can state legislators do to assist in the development of public transportation fleets that are running on fuel cells? Uh, Bob, would you like to start that one? Well, I, th I think you can look at what's what's occurred in different parts of the world as as ways to get that that um, started. In California, we've seen a a good blend of both vehicle as well as infrastructure incentives. Uh, clearly, you you have to um, support both, and whether that be through incentives for for individuals purchasing the vehicles, or for the infrastructure, or for the infrastructure providers to get the hydrogen to the market, all those are very beneficial. And they have to be balanced. Um, I, I think that that would be our, our first suggestion. Of course, central, some sort of centralized uh, federal government support is would also be helpful with with a plan, um, a roadmap of their own. Um, those, I think, are a couple of things that I would suggest. It, and I'll just say that um, you know, on the infrastructure side, um, you know, especially here in in the Northeast where where I'm located. Um, you know, we're, we're keenly aware that there are some uh, barriers to deployment that that need to be addressed. Um, and I think that trying to, uh, you know, have a kind of a, a, a unified approach to uh, regulations that allow the deployment of, of hydrogen infrastructure um, will will really help because uh, unfortunately each jurisdiction kind of has its own rules and that really has been a, a barrier to kind of really kicking off um, you know infrastructure deployment and vehicle deployment here in the Northeast. Great. Uh, just uh, one last question. Uh, I think this would be good for uh, air liquide or air products. Uh, can you speak about the cost competitive competitiveness of hydrogen and where you see uh, that developing? Sure, I'll uh, take that and then uh, ask my counterpart to weigh in uh, following. But uh, today, uh, certainly converting to uh, hydrogen, uh, what we commonly refer to as gray hydrogen or that hydrogen pro uh, provided by steam methane reformation uh, can autom quickly provide uh, a transition to lower emissions relative to a typical combustion engines, and that can usually be done fairly, in a fairly cost-effective manner. As we scale up in technologies, trying to decarbonize the fuel further, moving from gray to blue to green sources of hydrogen, with the latter being uh, carbon-free, certainly today that's more expensive than traditional transportation fuels, but we're certainly encouraged by the progress of the efficiency that OEMs have made in terms of the vehicles which ultimately enables the total cost of ownership to be driven down. And then similarly, we're building out world-scale production sources, uh, developing new technologies to rapidly bring that cost curve down because we recognize uh, in industry to drive adoption in, in the market, it, it needs to be cost competitive. I think early days, that's where, uh, back to the policy question, that's where governments and um, state agencies can step in to provide incentives to mitigate that higher cost at the early adoption phase until we can drive down to at scale and get to cost uh, parity. Yeah, I think that uh, I can um, totally agree with this. And uh, what, what we're seeing right now is that uh, it's really exciting time because we're seeing this scaling up, starting up. Um, and we are witnessing actually the emergence of a totally new industry for, 
for hydrogen. Um, it's going to take some time indeed, but um, the, the scale-up of building larger production, the scale-up of manufacturing capabilities, uh, the technology improvement that can be expected on all the technologies that we mentioned earlier, whether they are SMR or carbon capture sequestration or even electrolysis, um, will make those costs reduce over time. And again, just to emphasize what my uh, uh, colleagues have said, um, it's going to take some time and some uh, upfront effort and some approved support uh, for, for this scale-up to, to be achieved. But um, uh, some other industries have done that, like uh, wind power, solar power, you know, it's the type of cost curve that they followed over time. And, and this is what needs to happen for hydrogen as well. Great. Well, we have uh, a lot of uh, presentations still to go. So we will have another Q&A uh, following our industry panel, and I will kick this back to Kimberly now to introduce the panelists formally and uh, get started. Sure thing. Thanks, Connor. So we, we have the panelists um, all shown on screen here, so you can see their roles as I talk through them. So Corrine, who was just speaking, Corrine Boissy Rousseau, is president of Hydrogen Energy and Mobility North America uh, for Air Lake Heat North America. Um, we have Bob Wimmer here, Director of Energy and Environmental Research Group at Toyota, um, Toyota Motor North America. And we have Aaron Lane representing Plug Power. And then we've got Mark Monroe, um, who's um, at Microsoft doing data center advanced development. Eric Gucher, um, the General Manager for America's Growth Platforms for Air Products. And Stephen Szymanski, um, Vice President Sales and Marketing at Nell Hydrogen Americas. Um, so we'll, we'll hear from each of them in turn, and then we'll go back to our Q&A. And with that, it's my great pleasure to turn over to Corrine for our first presentation. Thank you very much, Kimberly. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today for uh, the Northeast Regional Launch of the Roadmap to a U.S. Hydrogen Economy. And I truly appreciate you inviting me. So my name is Karin Boyce Russo. I'm the president of Early Kid Hydrogen and Mobility Activity um, here in the U.S. Uh, and I'm here today to share with you some of what we in Early Kid are doing to make this hydrogen economy happen and what we're working towards in the Northeast to deliver a flexible pathway. So maybe a few words about Early Kid. Early Kid's business is to produce and distribute industrial gases, such as nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and hydrogen. Uh, we're a global company operating in 80 countries with the support of 67,000 employees. If you want to go next, maybe. So at Early Kid, we believe that energy transition is a necessity. We have announced our own climate objectives and we commit to reduce the carbon intensity of our own activities by 30% by 2025. And what we're doing in Early Kid is that we're leveraging our 50 plus years of world leadership in hydrogen, in, in hydrogen energy uh, in order to invent a cleaner, safer and more reliable energy market. And we do this through insight, innovation, and investment. In addition to this, uh, we also think about hydrogen and implementation as being one priority for early kids, uh, which is to also reach out to communities. For us, that means working on accessible supply to owners of all type of fuel cell electric vehicle and thinking through flexible solutions to reduce carbon emissions. So if we go next, I would say that what we're seeing right now is really an encouraging momentum for a wide variety of hydrogen energy project uh, announcements uh, right now in across North America. On the early kit side, we have already a solidly established um, uh, investments in the hydrogen value chain. Um, a few examples here on this slide. Uh, in the Texas Gulf Coast, we already have a long-standing hydrogen supply. We also operate the world's largest hydrogen cavern uh, to store gaseous uh, hydrogen in East Texas. We also have a network of uh, over 300 miles of pipeline and over a dozen of production plants throughout various locations in the US and in Canada, including Bécancourt in Quebec. We, we will talk about that later. Um, we also have uh, hydrogen refueling stations in California and others being deployed in the Northeast. And we are currently investing $200 million to build a brand new production facility located in Nevada uh, that will produce uh, liquid hydrogen for actually the West Coast market 
along with the logistic infrastructure going with that. Um, next, talking about Bécancourt uh, in Quebec. So in fact, today we held a live virtual press event announcing the completion of the world's largest um, proton exchange membrane electrolyzer in Bécancourt, Quebec. So this plant is actually um, a 20 megawatt uh, unit that will produce over eight tons per day of low carbon hydrogen using uh, renewable uh, electricity uh, since it's um, being supplied with uh, hydropower. So just to give you order of magnitude, those eight tons per day will be enough to fuel over 10,000 cars, uh, which is the equivalent of over 200 buses uh, and large trucks. Um, Bécancourt's proximity to the main industrial market in, in Quebec, but also in the Northeast, will actually be an essential uh, piece in the early kids supply infrastructure um, to supply uh, all of the low carbon hydrogen needs in, in, in those areas. And, and what I was saying earlier about scaling up, uh, I think that with this type of project, uh, like what we're doing there, we're already starting that um, the technology can reach industrial size and that the scale up has, has truly started. Next. So what are we doing in the Northeast? Well, along with those new investments, we, we want to also continue to be innovative and look at the evolution of the market needs and what is needed to provide filling station. Today, uh, refilling station are typically 700 bar. They are able to fill over 100 vehicles, but they have still a small capacity. So in the distribution model that we're considering, there are three options that are possible to meet those uh, needs and to fuel the station. So, you can supply hydrogen through gaseous deliveries, like what is shown on this slide, but you can also uh, produce hydrogen on, uh, on site with a small SMR or a small electrolyzer, for example, or you can use a liquid uh, distribution chain and liquid delivery. All of those technologies and um, pathways are viable options today. Uh, they have uh, all their different uh, application and and we'll see all of them in, in the market. But basically, we can say as a rule of thumb that liquid hydrogen can be transported over longer distance um, and at larger volumes than, than maybe gases. So next. So tomorrow, the next generation of station will actually have to have multiple fueling position and be able, able to fuel a wider variety of vehicles and with a much larger uh, capacity and going over a thousand kilograms per day of hydrogen. So we already know that the energy to compress gas up to 700 bar, which is the operating pressure of, of the station, is quite substantial. So for the future, what we see as option is um, liquid supply or on-site production next to the station. And this slide here shows what we're currently considering also for uh, supplying hydrogen in the Northeast. And today, what we're doing is that we're using the liquid uh, that we're producing in Bécancourt to actually transport it to our hub in Littleton, located near Boston. And from there, uh, we can regasify it and then uh, deliver the, the stations that we have. Uh, next. So this is a picture of our uh, station in Braintree in Massachusetts. And this is an example of uh, the type of investment that we're doing in the Northeast. Uh, so the technology that we have behind this branch station is actually a water electrolysis system to generate on-site um, produced hydrogen. And this is a, a technology, a very good example of uh, the type of technology and the type of innovative pathway that, uh, that we are investing in. So maybe as a conclusion, if we move on to the next slide, I would say that um, in early kid, we've been developing hydrogen for over 50 years on all steps uh, of the, the value chain. And we built the hydrogen market of today. So that makes us truly comfortable and confident in the hydrogen market of the future. With that being said, I'm handing it over to you back, back to you, Kimberly.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kareem. Uh, that was great to hear what you guys are doing in Hive. Um, now, with that, we're shifting gears over to Erin, who's representing Plug Power. Erin, over to you. Thank you so much for including me today. It's such a pleasure to be um, part of such an established panel. So let me start by introducing Plug Power. Plug Power is building the hydrogen economy as a leading provider of comprehensive fuel cell solutions. The company's innovative technology powers electric motors and hydrogen fuel cells in an ongoing paradigm shift in the power, energy, and transportation industries to address climate change and energy security while providing efficiency gains and meeting sustainability goals. We're headquartered in Latham, New York, but we have operations in Washington State and Ohio and employees in many, many states where we have systems deployed. Beyond the 40,000 fuel cell units shipped and deployed, Plug Power has continued to expand its business deeply into the hydrogen sector. With the recent acquisitions, Plug has increased its capability to become one of the largest green hydrogen generators over the next several years. This growth has been driven in the past from large material handling customers that continue to increase the utilization within their operations due to the significant value proposition that hydrogen fuel cells bring to their business. Next slide, please. So let me go through some of the highlights from the past year, because it's been a good one for the fuel cell business. The major theme has been green hydrogen. From working with and listening to our customers, governments, partners, and environmentalists, Plug Power has concluded that the path to success and growth in this industry is absolutely green hydrogen. One of our largest customers, Amazon, has a net zero carbon goal of 0% by 2040, 10 years ahead of the Paris Climate Agreement. Walmart has identical goals. Both understand hydrogen needs to be part of the mix to achieve these goals. 190 governments around the world have signed up to the Paris Climate Agreement. And these goals cannot be met without hydrogen. And this is why. Europe plans to deploy 40 gigawatts of electrolyzers by 2030 and another 40 gigawatts in North Africa. In the United States, the newly elected Biden administration and Congress support green hydrogen and fuel cells. We're thrilled to report from our extensive conversations on and off Capitol Hill, addressing climate change has become a bipartisan issue. There's no doubt to me that our leaders understand hydrogen a necessary part of these climate goals. So why do they think this way? So in mobility, the lightweight and high energy density makes fuel cells the technology of choice for commercial applications until 2030. We will have a prominent position in all on-road vehicles past 2030. This does not even take into account the benefits of fast fueling and twice the range of battery electric vehicles. When utilities are considering hydrogen, they are focused on long-term storage. For storage needs over 11 hours, work by UC Irvine and others suggest hydrogen is the preferred choice, again, because of energy density. From this, energy that is stored can be put on the grid using plug power stationary fuel cell systems or used for fuel for on-road vehicles. Then thinking about other applications, hydrogen is also critical for industrial processes like ammonia, steel, and cement manufacturing. The carbon footprint for these applications is equivalent to on-road vehicles, and hydrogen is the only viable source to provide the high green heat required by this application. Plug Power concludes that to be the first mover and the driver of the hydrogen economy, we need not only for our fuel cell system, but the ability to generate that green hydrogen. And that's what we started to do in 2020 via two critical acquisitions. Diener ELX provided us technology leadership with the PEM electrolyzers. We are now leveraging plug power scale and manufacturing prowess via our own Gigafactory to drive down costs and provide scale manufacturing. United Hydrogen provided plug power the capability to build large scale liquid hydrogen plants. They were the first private company to accomplish such a feat. We didn't stop there in 2020. We are also pleased to announce yesterday that a fourth pedestal customer is coming online. This customer is an auto manufacturer with over 50 plants worldwide. We will be doing four sites to start in 2020. So started last year, we're ready to go. Part of our long-term plan includes plug power penetrating the on-road vehicle market and large-scale stationary markets. Our recent announcements with Renault and SK not only support this goal, but provides us with a global footprint. We're proud to say Plug Power is now worldwide. 
finally, in 2020, we didn't forget our basic blocking and tackling. We, we achieved our over $330 million in invoicing. With our strong bookings, we have been able to up our 2020 guidance. And part of moving forward, PLUG is increasing our target for green hydrogen. Next slide, please. We're going to build out our first nationwide green hydrogen network. We will have 500 um, tons per day by 2025 and have the capacity of over 50 tons per day by 2022. We won't do this alone, but we'll do it with partners, including traditional players and some novel partners. We're looking to expand to 1,000 tons per day by the end of 2020, or excuse me, 2028, with a mix of about 30% being outside the U.S. And to reiterate, this not only builds our green hydrogen business, but it also builds our fuel cell business. To date, we've expanded our hydrogen refueling station network to well over 100 sites with the expectation that growth rate for 2021 to be even higher. Next slide, please. We recently announced the first PEM Technology Gigafactory will be outside of Rochester, New York. This will not only drive expansion and scale for our fuel cell business, but will also be the production facility for electrolyzer stats and systems. The release of our ProGen Energy engine line will be the building block for other modular engines and will be the enabler for Plug to expand into multiple mobility and large stationary applications. Next slide, please. With all of this market acceleration, Plug is increasing our targets for 2021 and 2024. In 2021, we've raised the target to 475 million. We have over 90% in backlog. Usually at this time, we have 70%. This is 40% growth from 2020. Now, with our combination of our SK Venture, green hydrogen, and market acceleration, we are upping our targets to 1.7 billion for 2024. I should also note that SK can consume internally much of this increased target. So what did you hear today? We're the leader today in building the hydrogen economy leader in fuel cells deployed, fuel, fueling stations, and the usage of hydrogen as fuel. But this is just the start. You have heard our ambition in green hydrogen will build out the first green hydrogen network across the nation. By 2025, we'll have 500 tons of capacity and 1,000 tons of green hydrogen by 2028 around the world. Our relationships with Renault and SK will help ignite our on-road and stationary businesses. We will have a global scale manufacturing footprint. We will partner with others to achieve these goals. We have the financial wherewithal to achieve these goals. And have the necessary foundation to be an industry leader in the future of a 10, or trillion, $10 trillion hydrogen economy. And that's what Plug is today. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to present. And I look forward to answering any questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. That's an incredible growth story from Plug Power. So next up in our panel is Bob Wimmer from Toyota. Um, Bob, do you want to turn on your camera and I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Kimberly. I'd also like to thank um, the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association for arranging this briefing and inviting Toyota to speak today. I've been involved with hydrogen and fuel cells most of my career and have never seen this level of excitement or opportunity. Industry is making great progress commercializing all types of transportation, stationary, and industrial applications for hydrogen. And Toyota is on the forefront, working hard to commercialize a range of fuel cell products. Next slide, please. The environment is our motivation. In 2015, Toyota announced our 2050 Environmental Challenge. It contains six parts that lays out global environmental targets for all parts of our business. The first of these is a 90% reduction in new vehicle tailpipe emissions by 2050. Our pathway to accomplishing that reduction includes offering an electrified version of every model by 2025, accounting for roughly 50% of new vehicle sales. In 2020, approximately 1 million of our 5.5 million electrified vehicles will be zero emission, either fuel cell or battery electric. We estimate this will reduce new vehicle CO2 emissions by approximately 35% from our 2010 baseline. 
electrification in all forms, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, battery electric, and of course, hydrogen fuel cells is essential for reducing global CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. A portfolio of electric drive options is necessary to meet the various needs and desires of our customers throughout the world. The foundation to this portfolio is hybrid. In the US, this includes 15 Toyota and Lexus hybrid models, ranging from compact sedans to our flagship Lexus models. This extensive hybrid experience helps accelerate development of our plug-in and fuel cell vehicles. Our plug-in hybrids at the bottom of the page include the economic Prius Prime and the sporty RAV4 Prime. On the right side is our fuel cell Mirai that was introduced in 2015. Over 6,500 of the first generation model were sold in the US between 2015 and 2020. The recently induced second generation 2021 Mirai is a huge step forward. In addition to its stunning good looks, its base price is approximately 10% lower than the previous model, is more fuel efficient and can travel up to 402 miles on a single tank of hydrogen. As with the previous model, it can be refueled in less than five minutes at a conventional fueling dispenser and comes with three years of free fuel. The 2021 Mirai is on sale in California today and we hope to launch it in the Northeast in the next few years. Next slide, please. Toyota designs our fuel cell systems to be modular and scalable. This allows major components in the system module to be used in a variety of applications, increasing production volume and reducing per unit cost. For example, on the upper right, Class 8 trucks and transit buses use two fuel cell system modules. The remainder of the powertrain is then optimized for the application by fine tuning the size of the motor, hybrid battery pack, and hydrogen capacity. For many medium duty applications, the single fuel cell module can be used with an appropriately sized battery. We are also looking at industrial applications where something smaller than the 128 kilowatt Mirai fuel cell system is used. Next slide, please. Toyota is developing both medium and heavy duty vehicles with our fuel cell system. We have two class eight tractor programs. The first is with Kenworth, where we began deploying 10 Class 8 zero emission tractors last month for operation out of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. They'll be used to haul drayage from the ports to destinations around the LA basin. The second is with Hino USA. More details are expected soon on that project. We also built 100 Sora fuel cell buses for operation in the Tokyo Olympics and have numerous medium duty truck and industrial vehicle prototypes operating in Japan today. Next slide, please. Diversification of both hydrogen supply and demand is necessary for the success of fuel cell vehicles. To assure an adequate supply of affordable hydrogen throughout the country, we must make use of regional hydrogen feedstocks. In some areas, this may be excess renewable electricity. In others, the feedstocks could be biomethane or natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration. For vehicles, there's a synergistic relationship between light duty passenger vehicles and heavy duty commercial vehicles. Passenger vehicles drive fuel cell system technology advancement and volumes, thereby reducing cost. Commercial vehicles, on the other hand, drive hydrogen demand by consuming orders of magnitude more hydrogen per day than light duty vehicles. This ultimately reduces fuel costs and accelerates refueling infrastructure development and deployment. Next slide, please. To conclude, I wanna circle back to where I started. This is an exciting time for working on commercializing hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles. So much interest and opportunity. We just need to work together to make it happen. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Bob, thank you so much for bringing to life uh, what hydrogen can look like in the automotive sector and making that real and visual for people. So I'll now switch gears and go into our next speaker, um, which will be Mark from Microsoft. And Mark, you can take us away. Mark, you're on mute. 
the there we go. Most See, part of Central Twenty Twenty. Alrighty. <laughs> and you'd think this isn't our tool, so you know what? Uh, what could I say? Um, uh, I want to give everybody a little bit of an overview because you may not be familiar with the the world of data centers, and so we'll start out a little bit, kind of setting the stage for for why we're interested in hydrogen in data centers. So let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of uh, our CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, at the Ignite conference a little over a year ago. And he stood up on stage and said, we're gonna move from about 45, uh, 40 uh, zettabytes of information to 175 zettabytes of information in the internet by 2025. So let's go to the next slide. For those of you that aren't familiar with what's a zettabyte, uh, this could be the first time that you hear about it. There's a little guide over on the on the far right of this slide. A zettabyte is a billion terabytes, a trillion gigabytes. Now, uh, there's a device that's on the market today that uh, from EMC uh, that stores about one petabyte of information. A petabyte is a, a million gigabytes. Uh, and, and it takes up about 22 square feet, uses uh, around 17 kilowatts of power. Um, and what Satya is saying is that we will need 135 million of these racks of storage in just four years. So let's go to the next slide. That means if we were to lay those out side by side, only space to walk between them, uh, it would cover 100 miles, 100 square miles, 10 miles square. If you lay that over Los Angeles, um, you'd be going from Long Beach to Compton and from Torrance over to Lakewood. Um, so that would just be the storage that's required in the next four years in the in the internet. Now that's not just Microsoft, that's the whole internet. But still, that's an incredible 100 square miles of storage. And oh, by the way, if you click advance, um, we'll need two uh, nuclear power plants to power that that hundred square miles of storage. So somewhere on the planet in the next four years, all of this storage will will go. Let's go to the next slide. Another idea about scale. This is uh, the town of Boyton in Virginia, Southern Virginia. <clears throat> you can see the outline of the town in light yellow. The darker yellow is um, the land that Microsoft owns that we're going to build data centers on over the next five to ten years. So you can see we're, we're bigger than the town of Boyton in, in southwest Virginia and we'll be consuming lots and lots of resources there. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, an aerial image to give you an idea of how fast the, the data center industry moves. Um, this is a picture of our data centers in Quincy, Washington, the eastern part of Washington state. Uh, each of these buildings, the, the kind of uh, rectangular buildings where you see a grouping of two and then two and then two and then two, each one of those buildings, half of the pairs, uh, use about eight megawatts of electricity. <clears throat> and that's where all your emails and your cat videos and your online shopping and your emergency response services and banking and uh, you know very important things are stored. So we have to have backup power for every megawatt of IT equipment that's inside these buildings. So the eight buildings that you can see there, the front building is an administrative building for the data center, but the eight buildings is 64 megawatts of compute capacity. And this picture taken in July of 2018 is really far out of date, even though it's only two years old. Let's go to the next slide. A more recent picture from March of 2020 shows the orange uh, arrows are, are pointing at the original buildings that you were looking at, those that grouping of eight. There are four more buildings to the south of those. Um, each one of the buildings in the, to the south has the same capacity as the four up above. So it's actually, we've actually quadrupled the amount of uh, infrastructure that is there. And this is a, a 100 megawatt plus site. Uh, for the for the internet, and this is one of um, Microsoft has more than a hundred sites worldwide. Not all of them are quite as big as Quincy, but it just gives you an example of uh, how fast and how large this industry could be. And there's 25 hyperscale companies in the world that you can probably name: Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, ByteDance, the folks behind TikTok, Baidu, Tencent, and so there, there's around the world. There's folks building similar scale. Let's go to the next slide. And this gets us to why we're interested in hydrogen at large scales. 
every one of those megawatts of IT that we talked about has to be backed up because the computers are sensitive to uh, disturbances in power. And even when there are power outages, uh, data center infrastructure is becoming more and more critical, providing critical services, including emergency services, 911 services, tele telephony, contact information, um, to be able to, to go through disasters or through political uh, environments. So there's very critical applications that are going on there. Today, everyone in the industry uses big diesel backup, which is okay, except um, they're still noisy, they pollute when they run. Um, running a, a diesel test at the site uh, in Quincy that you could see, we'd be running a, um, something like 17 tests every day uh, that'll be running uh, and that, that releases particulates into the air and so on. So we're interested in looking at zero carbon backup. Uh, and, and as you know, Microsoft made a big commitment about a year ago to be actually carbon negative by 2030. Uh, and so we've got to make sure that our backup power fits that profile as well. Next slide, please. This is a, a rendering of uh, what we think a hydrogen powered backup system might look like for a data center. On the left, is an image of our three megawatt diesel generators that we use today. And you can kind of see on the side of the, the enclosure, there is a person-sized door, two person-sized doors, so you can get a sense of how big this thing really is. On the right would be an equivalent three megawatt hydrogen powered generator with its storage. The, the diesel generator has a belly tank that, that holds about 17,000 gallons of diesel underneath it we'd have to go with a liquid storage tank that probably would be around 18,000 gallons, even though we're showing a 25,000 gallon tank there. Uh, and we'd have to have enough of these to power the hundreds of megawatts at any one given site. So we may not go with individual tanks, we'll combine infrastructure uh, as we go along. But we're right now running tests, we're, we're developing this system, and we'll be um, running a three megawatt test sometime in calendar 2021 to prove the scale, prove that the fuel cell systems can go to the scale that we need. And then we're working on the economics and the other technical issues as well, so that this could be an alternative to diesel generators around the world. Next slide, please. Now, if you start to think about how much hydrogen we need and what, and, and what we're gonna do with it, in a backup power application, the fuel just sits there and waits until an emergency happens. Uh, in our case, let's say that we were talking about one of those uh, original data centers in the aerial photograph, 30 megawatts or so, 32 megawatts of, of uh, IT capacity would require 100 tons of liquid hydrogen to be stored on site waiting for an emergency. And we don't think that's very practical. And in fact, since the, the generators can produce electricity without pollution, uh, we think that there's there's more uses than can be envisioned for just the diesel generators, um, which can only be used for emergency power generation according to their air quality permits. So let's go to the next slide. We see that uh, the data center, of course, we're data center people, so we see the data center as the center of the world, um, but we think it could participate in a larger hydrogen economy. Things like firming up uh, renewable energy resources by putting electrolyzers at our data centers and sharing our storage tanks. Maybe instead of a 100 ton tank, we build a 150 ton tank and we lease out the top half to uh, a gas supplier or to a vehicle refueler or to a material handling company or to a power company uh, in order to be able to balance the grid. We can participate with electrolyzers and uh, fuel cells in all kinds of grid ancillary services where we help balance the electric power needed on the grid. Fast frequency response, peak shaving, demand response, black starts, all of these things could be available with the data center contributing and participating in the local grid economy. And if we had electrolyzer resources at the data center and excess power capacity, it's possible that we could consume electricity that might have otherwise been curtailed from renewable resources and convert it into fuels that could be used in transport, in heating systems, blending into natural gas pipelines and so on. So we, we envision the data center of the future to be a both a producer and a consumer of energy in the, uh, the future, uh, and especially in, as a part of the hydrogen economy. And I think that's my last slide. So I'll turn it back to you, Kimberly. Super. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks for taking us through that journey from zettabates of data to 
not the hydrogen economy and Microsoft's role. Um, it's amazing that, to see what the, you know, both what hydrogen can do for Microsoft and what micro, Microsoft can do to support this growing market. Um, so with that, we've got an, our next presenter, uh, which will be Eric from Air Products. Uh, thank you, Eric. So with that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Kimberly. It's a pleasure to be here today for the Northeast region launch of the Roadmap to a U.S. Hydrogen Economy. I would like to thank the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association for inviting me to participate all of our distinguished guests. The Northeast has been a leader in the U.S. energy transition and has and is developing strong policy supporting the reduction of carbon emissions. We applaud and support your efforts, which are consistent with those of air products. Next slide, please. Air products is the the largest US-based global industrial gas supplier and is a world leader in hydrogen production and hydrogen for mobility applications. We have decades of demonstrated safe experience producing hydrogen in all forms from gray to blue to green, have a variety of technologies to transport it and differentiated technology to dispense it to our customers. We are com committed to developing new sources and types of hydrogen to rapidly meet our customers and our own carbon reduction goals and are investing now to accelerate the transition to zero emissions. Next slide, please. At Air Products, we are focused on three main areas of growth, which include gasification, carbon capture and storage, and hydrogen for mobility, all of which support a vision towards decarbonization. We have established ourselves as global leaders in each of these areas with significant technology deployed in real world projects, which are recognized by our customers as best in class. Next slide, please. As an example of this expertise, in 2014, in partnership with the Department of Energy, we commissioned a world-scale carbon capture project in Port Arthur, Texas, using uh, in-house technology that uh, Air Products developed. This technology, which was applied to existing hydrogen production facilities, resulted in significant carbon reductions, and we continue to permanently remove approximately 1 million tons of CO2 annually from our facilities, which would have otherwise been released into the atmosphere. With this, we have demonstrated at scale the viability of what is commonly referred to as blue hydrogen production, transitioning from gray hydrogen, steam methane reforming, uh, applying carbon capture and storage technologies. We are proud of this accomplishment and look forward to deploying it more fully in the areas supporting capture, carbon capture and storage, which the U.S. is blessed with about 80% of the world's geology to support this technology. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, Air Products has been a pioneer in the hydrogen for mobility space, having executed over 250 projects around the globe and one and a half million fuelings annually. If it has wheels, we've probably fueled it with hydrogen from forklifts to cars, to buses, to trucks, to trains. We believe that hydrogen has an integral role to play in the decarbonization of hard to abate mobility and industrial applications and are investing significantly in this area. Next slide, please. To that end, we have announced the world's largest two-day green hydrogen production facility, which will produce hydrogen from electrolysis using renewable energy from the sun and wind. Our facility, which will be on stream in 2025, will produce 650 metric tons a day of carbon-free hydrogen intended to support the energy transition in heavy-duty mobility applications, where hydrogen has a distinct role to play. Already, there are a number of demonstration and commercial projects demonstrating the viability of these heavy duty vehicles, and we aim to ensure hydrogen is available for their conversion to zero emissions. Next slide, please. In total, this project we call NEOM is a $7 billion investment, $5 billion in production, and $2 billion in downstream infrastructure, which will create thousands of jobs to support governments and our customers with a vision to transitioning the mobility and other hard to abate sectors to zero emissions. We are incredibly excited about this project, aligned with our core values to create a better environment, and look forward to working with industry and government on the journey towards zero emissions. We still appreciate your time, and I'll now turn it back over to Kimberly. Super, thank you, Eric. Thanks for giving a preview of what one of those mega projects can look like. Um, so with that, uh, we'll talk, we'll have one more presentation related to hydrogen production. Um, I will hand over to Steve Szymanski from now. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, you know, we were asked to try to kind of bring it home to the Northeast um, since it's, this is the Northeast rollout. And since I live here in Connecticut, I uh, figured I'll 
start off with just a really quick uh, unscripted anecdote. Um, you know, we got a, a few inches of snow here in Connecticut last night. And as I was uh, running my 10 horsepower Husqvarna snowblower this morning at six o'clock in the morning, I was thinking, gee, wouldn't it be great if I had uh, something that was quiet and zero emissions to, to move snow? And uh, it got me thinking about the outdoor power equipment sector, which is kind of kind of interesting because you have just a huge range of energy requirements and duty cycles. And, you know, I bought my first, you know, battery electric uh, piece of power equipment last year, and that was a, a string trimmer. And I thought about how much I love my battery uh, string trimmer because, you know, it's it's quiet and instant on and but it's addressing a really easy application. It's, it's, you know, I run it a half an hour a week and I'm cutting grass. I mean, it's a pretty light duty application. But when we get a, a big dump of snow here in New England, um, you know, I can't, you know, I can't fathom that there's ever going to be a, a snowblower that can uh, address my kind of, you know, energy requirements and duty cycle for clearing a 200 foot driveway. And so, you know, I, I think about how, you know, hydrogen really fills a really important, um, you know, gap in electrification that, you know, batteries just can't. And um, it was just kind of uh, a good thought exercise uh, for myself this morning as I was as I was clearing the driveway, waking my neighbors up at six o'clock in the morning doing uh, clearing snow. Having said that, uh, I, I'll, I'll start off by saying I, I don't have kind of an introduction to Nell slide, but um, in, uh, you know, in 50 words or less, you know, our company is a, um, a leading hydrogen production and infrastructure OEM. Uh, I represent the electrolyzer division of Nell, uh, you know, providing both uh, PEM and alkaline electrolyzer solutions to providing um, uh, green hydrogen to the, to the hydrogen economy. Uh, next slide, Connor. So I, you know, it's been touched on a, a couple of times, you know, Kimberly addressed it in her opening remarks that, you know, the EU has really taken a, a, a leadership role in, in kind of addressing kind of a, the, the green hydrogen economy and putting out uh, real targets, hard targets, and providing funding. And, you know, I think that's really important for, uh, for the rollout of, of the hydrogen economy, but it's also very, very important for OEMs who are trying to do planning and uh, build out to address the, the kinds of volumes and requirements that we see coming. Having these kind of very specific uh, targets in place and, and funding to back it up really helps us to plan out what we need to do to provide the kind of production capacity that's going to be required to meet these kind of targets. Next slide, Connor. So, you know, I think, you know, this has been touched on a couple times how the, you know, the opportunity for, for hydrogen is, is really pretty vast. I mean, when we look at, you know, today's worldwide kind of hydrogen market, you know, you know, 70 million uh, metric tons per year, um, you know, we really see some, you know, some tremendous growth over the next, um, you know, over the next few years and, and, and beyond in the ensuing decades. And the thing that's really driving it is not these kind of traditional uh, end uses for the hydrogen, which are, you know, again, you know, chemicals and refineries. Uh, it's really these new growth sectors. Uh, and we, we've talked about some of these, you know, kind of power generation, um, you know, building heat and power, industrial energy and, and transportation. And these are the things that are really going to end up dwarfing the um, kind of the current application space for hydrogen. And, and this is really where um, you know, we're, we're focused on providing solutions to address those emerging markets. Next slide, please. Uh, and really, it's, it's the 
rapidly decreasing cost of renewables that is what is enabling the opportunity for green hydrogen. And, you know, these are a couple of curves that, you know, I think folks have probably seen before how, you know, the levelized cost of energy of, of wind and solar has um, dropped over the last decade or so. And really, um, you know, we, we expect some additional uh, reduction in, in LCOE from these energy sources. And really, when you look at the, the cost, the production cost of, of green hydrogen from these sources, I mean, it's, you know, it's roughly 70 to 80 percent of the, the total cost of, of the hydrogen production. So, you know, really, this is the thing that is, is really helping to enable, um, you know, hydrogen production from electrolysis to be cost competitive. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, that we are doing to address the, the rapid growth of uh, you know, hydrogen production requirements is a, you know, an expanded production capability in Norway for our alkaline uh, electrodes. And this is a, a new facility that we are building out right now in, in Haroya near Oslo. And we are, you know, building, um, you know, multiple production lines for electrodes uh, based on kind of best manufacturing pra practices, um, you know, new and innovative uh, uh, techniques, you know, for automation and things like that. Uh, we are going to have the, um, the capacity for about 500 megawatts of uh, electrode production by the end of the year with expansion plans to go beyond two gigawatts of production capacity annually in the next few years. So it, it's it's very important to the markets that we're serving that it, it's understood that, you know, the, the capacity is being built out, uh, it is coming, and that we are uh, we are addressing this this kind of rapid growth in, in hydrogen production demand. Next slide, please. And, you know, we have a, a long experience at Nell with, with uh, designing and, and building large scale renewable energy plants, uh, or I should say re renewable uh, electrolyzer plants. And on the left is, is a picture of a, a large, um, you know, 135 megawatt electrolyzer installation in Norway from the, the, the first half of the 20th century and how we are um, leveraging that experience uh, to design, you know, um, you know, large scale hydrogen production plants based on kind of the modular technology that, that we've developed over the last uh, nearly 100 years at, at Nell. Next slide, please. And so this slide, I, I apologize, it's a, it's a little bit fuzzy, at least the way it looks to me on the screen. Uh, but this is just a, a kind of a, a, a comparison of cost. Uh, this was done by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, comparing, you know, kind of renewable hydrogen in, in the green boxes and in, in kind of a, a banded uh, depiction versus uh, what we call, you know, kind of low carbon hydrogen or blue hydrogen from both coal with CCS and natural gas um, with CCS. And, you know, you can see as you uh, look ahead um, over, the next, uh, over the next three or four decades, how, um, you know, they see the cost of renewable hydrogen compared to those, um, you know, kind of blue hydrogen sources. And you know, last week we we had a um, uh, kind of an in investor day summit where we rolled out a a target uh, by 2024 of a dollar fifty per kilogram, uh, you know, for for production cost from electrolysis. And you know, we we really do think this is achievable. We think it's uh, going to come sooner than than Bloomberg is depicting here. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll touch on this uh, in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So when we look at kind of our, our, our total cost of ownership, um, you know, for, for our technology, you know, just doing 
you know, some making some basic assumptions, um, you know, about energy costs and, and land and water and, and things like that. Um, you know, we compare kind of, you know, 20 megawatt, you know, plant designs versus 100 megawatts. Um, you know, including some some very modest uh, improvements in in efficiency um, by 2024, and you can see here, you know, the you know a TCO of you know going down to about a dollar seventy seven uh, per kilogram. We think is is very achievable. You know, all in uh, just just based on kind of designs that that we have in. In development today and technology pathways that that are already um, you know we're already pursuing next slide please and that's it I, I appreciate it and back to you Kimberly super thanks Steve um, to, uh, you mentioned that there's rapid growth in this industry and I think to put a finer point on it it's really exponential growth you know that we're seeing in the demand for electrolysis so it's great to see the production scale up and how that's happening. I'm sure some members of our audience are wondering how to make that happen in the US. So uh, we might come to that in Q&A. With that, I'm going to invite all of our, our panelists back to put their cameras on again. Um, thank you to everyone for the fantastic presentations. It's incredible to see the momentum across the hydrogen value chain. Um, so for our, our audience here, as a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them through the questions box um, on GoToWebinar. And with that, Connor, do we have any questions for our panel? Yes, uh, we got a, one question to kick things off. Um, we'll direct this to Corrine, and then uh, I think the other uh, participants on the panel can uh, answer following that. Um, what policy actions are needed to advance clean hydrogen in the Northeast? Yeah, well, thank you very much for this question. Um, I think we touched upon it uh, earlier in the different presentations, but basically a, a successful transition will require a portfolio of policies. You need policies that encourage customers to adopt vehicles, you need policies to encourage fuels to be low carbon, and you need policies to support the fueling infrastructure and provide some funding mechanism. So programs such as uh, more EV in Massachusetts or the LCFS program in California, for example, are, are very good example of policies that uh, could be deployed. Great, and would any other uh, panelists like to answer that? Uh, yeah, just to build on that, uh, certainly uh, there are some already uh, regulatory uh, actions that are underway. Uh, Massachusetts has announced um, the uh, ban of the sale of the combustion engine by a certain date uh, out in 2035, consistent with California. Uh, in addition to that, New York State is considering uh, adopting a low carbon fuel cell, low carbon fuel standard analogous to that of California. I think what's important in all of this is a committed and sustained vision towards decarbonization. I think with that commitment and sustained vision, that will encourage the investment that's needed. Uh, both by automakers and hydrogen producers and infrastructure infrastructure providers uh, to make those investments uh, to uh, take us on that journey to uh, zero carbon emissions vehicles. And I'll, I'll just say that kind of beyond transportation, I think that, um, uh, you know, energy storage uh, mandates uh, will, will also help drive some investment in um, you know some some new technologies that that can support you know large scale uh, deployment of of energy storage projects and and I really do believe that you know hydrogen can address part of that sector as well. Yeah, and in terms of next step for the Northeast, I think that where we're at right now is that we need to encourage large projects and the support of authorities for large projects because that's what you need to establish a market and, and allow to, to kick off the infrastructure. Great, uh, this next question is directed towards market Microsoft. Uh, is Microsoft going to produce its own hydrogen infrastructure for data centers or are you planning to per partner with other uh, companies for this technology? Yeah, my, my colleagues at Microsoft, um, 
tell me that I, I say this too often, but I'm a great believer that companies ought to stay in their swim lanes. Uh, Microsoft is, uh, you know, a software and digital infrastructure company, and uh, and so we definitely will be looking for partners uh, to to help us with hydrogen infrastructure all the way around. Uh, you know, on on interacting with the grid, on storage, on production. Uh, so all those different areas will definitely partner up. Now, what Microsoft is is probably going to do though is we're gonna we're gonna use our digital infrastructure and our secure communications infrastructure to help gather uh, the digital portion of that marketplace. And so we'd love to be monitoring production and projecting marketplaces and optimizing sales and and uh, and revenue so that we can do it with the machine learning and AI. Those are the places where Microsoft, I think, will contribute in our swim lane uh, in the hydrogen economy. Great. Uh, there's actually multiple questions uh, regarding uh, partnerships or agreements between the companies on here. Um, I guess to Ehrlichied, Kareen, would you like to talk about any of the partnerships that you guys have with any of the other companies? And we can just throw it to other panelists after that. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. What we are observing right now is clearly the emergence of a new industry and not a single company can do that on their own. So it will require really working together and aligning uh, uh, resources to make this happen. So uh, on the early kid side, uh, specifically in North America, we've taken some uh, equity position in, for example, in California with uh, First Element Fuel, who is the largest uh, retailer uh, and uh, operator of hydrogen station uh, uh, over there. And we've also partnered with uh, Cummings and Hydrogenics on uh, their different technologies. So um, more will come clearly in terms of partnership, but um, uh, clearly it will be an essential lever for this cost to be reduced over time and all of the discussions that we had earlier. Uh, would any other panelists like to comment on that? Yeah, Eric? Connor, I'll... I'll... Thanks, Bob. mentioned something. I, I think when it comes to the, the vehicle and infrastructure side, partnerships, relationships are, are critical because both have to be scaled in, in unison. So you, the customers have the infrastructure they need to use the vehicle as they desire, and there's enough vehicles on the roads to support the infrastructure. So we have multiple different partnerships, arrangements, agreements with, with f different fuel providers, um, with, with uh, PACAR, the truck manufacturer for our, our heavy duty vehicle work, um, medium duty truck manufacturers, Hino also in the US, I think I mentioned them. So that's really a key going forward is these partnerships. And if you can bring in um, public entities as well, there's another opportunity to, to work together to, to um, move move the whole technology forward so Connor, i'll add something too if you don't mind so i i think throughout my presentation it was clear that plug power relies on partnerships very clearly from the the use of hydrogen you know production and, and within their systems but also as we move into the green hydrogen space making sure that we're adding partnerships with um groups like Brookfield Renewables and Apex and others who are gonna get us to the place where we are able to produce that green hydrogen. So um, our partnerships continue to grow, both here in the United States and internationally. Yeah, Aaron, I'll just, I'll say that, um, you know, from Nell's side as well, I think we see um, for green hydrogen to be successful, you know, we need to work closely with, with energy companies, uh, particularly renewable energy companies, because it's, it's really that close integration of um, renewable energy technology and electrolyzer technology that's going to make green hydrogen uh, affordable and, and, uh, and successful. Absolutely. Great. And uh, another question I think would be good for you to answer, Steve, to get started. Can you talk more about the potential for hydrogen to be part of the problem of balancing a green power grid? Yeah, I mean, I think that when you look at, um, you know, the, the increasing penetration of renewables in uh, grid systems around the world, um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a foregone conclusion that we're going to need a, a portfolio approach for um, how to uh, time shift energy, uh, 
you know, uh, in that kind of scenario. And I think that, you know, batteries do a good job for, for short duration shifting. Um, I, you know, I've always maintained that really hydrogen plays well, um, you know, at, at longer time scales and, and, and higher power levels. And, you know, I, I really think that, you know, hydrogen is going to play a really important um, role in that kind of balancing, uh, especially as we get higher penetrations of renewables. I, I really feel that it's really one of the only solutions that is, is really viable for that kind of scale of, of shifting. Great. Uh, and then uh, one final question to round this out. Uh, this is from a legislator in Massachusetts working on introducing legislation for fuel cell vehicles and hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, they are asking, what are the next steps for creating a hydrogen energy supply chain and market beyond the Braintree Station in Massachusetts? Any insight would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so I think this would be, uh, is directed towards Kareen, but I think other panelists can also answer that. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, and I would say that uh, indeed in the Northeast and in the Massachusetts, uh, we see a, a clear potential for, for developing a market. So we truly appreciate the question. Um, I think that the, the, the short and easy answer again is, uh, is uh, support from authorities and policy, policies and fundings in order to kick this off, uh, along with the support for a few large projects. Um, I think that we have the right uh, momentum uh, today to, to trigger all of this and, and, and we didn't talk about that, but at federal level also with the new Biden administration and uh, um, their climate plan, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of things will be happening. So, um, um, yeah, clearly, um, I think that it's the right time to start discussing about uh, policies and an appropriate mechanism to to kick this off. So if you don't mind, I'm going to add something to where uh, this is a great <clears throat> opportunity to work with the Hyd Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. If you are introducing legislation, so we our membership has a wide variation of the different aspects of the hydrogen fuel cell um, world. And so we would gladly work with you and reach out to our members and make sure that you're getting the answers that you need and making sure that you're representing what is involved with throughout the industry and really promoting the hydrogen fuel cell market and, and doing the best that we can so we can grow and do, do better. So thanks and hopefully we'll get to talk to you again at another point offline. Thank you, Erin, for these compliments. And, uh, and just, to, just to round that out, uh, you know, uh, I think the question was around the supply chain. So the supply chain exists today. There is a North American hydrogen supply chain uh, to serve uh, industrial and mobility applications, both in liquid and gaseous uh, forms. And so it's really about working together to develop the markets and the policy that will support the build out of the infrastructure and the development and rollout of the vehicles in jurisdictions like yours, uh, as you see that as part of your uh, decarbonization strategy. So with that, th thank you, Eric, and thank you to all of our panelists for your time and your insights today. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for their questions. Um, and also a big thank you to the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association um, for collecting us all here. As a final reminder, uh, the full roadmap is available online. So here's the, the website, www.ushydrogenstudy.org. And with that, uh, we'll conclude today's event. And thank you all again for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.